good evening everybody i am tana rupa ranjani on behalf of the uh, institute of organizing committee of the institute of urban design in sri lanka i welcome all of you to the urban talks which is organized by the urban designers sri lanka the program of urban talks has been started on december 2020 and happy to say we have successfully completed six programs today we are attending to the program seven now we will move to the welcome speech i cordially invite the president of the institute of urban design in sri lanka dr yanka vijay sundara to deliver the welcome remarks sir the platform is your own um <clears throat> thank you rupa um so let let me start uh, officially the session um as uh, mentioned that we are going to have seventh one seventh urban talk today and uh, on behalf of the institute and the council of the institute i welcome all the participants today uh, and also uh, warm welcome to the speaker today uh, professor lee <coughs> and uh, so we had been going all around the places during past 7 months uh, so we we almost heard from many cities uh, germany india singapore canada nepal hong kong uh, and uh, dhaka and today uh, we are going to hear from uh, china beijing so um, our relationships with china just give me just a very brief introduction uh, it's the background of the uh, context where we had been having a lot of connections uh, across the ocean uh, kalambu being one of the major points uh, in terms of maritime transportation so we all know the silk road uh, land as well as the um, sea route so uh, uh, silk road started uh, according to the records that 2nd uh, century bc and mostly active in uh, 15th century ad and started from china and uh, and and that is a link uh, across uh, this part of world towards the far east uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, europe and so on so uh, so in this context uh, we could see lot of historical records uh, and um, our relationship with china dated back to 20th, 20th centuries uh, basically through religious and cultural uh, links and there were several visitors during the past uh, fazian uh, 5th century ad and uh, zheng he uh, to sri lanka and uh, several uh, say exchanges and uh, visits and uh, uh, things like that at historically but uh, towards the uh, post independence period that we had been having with lot of agreements uh, especially economic as well as techn technological cooperation uh, since 1952 and uh, so he had listed few uh, agreements such agreements that we had been having and uh, we are continuing even right now uh, with the 50 years of um, establishment of our relationship with china and uh, of course economically it's, it's quite significant in these days uh, the places like uh, mega investments like uh, port city and various harbor developments in, in this country uh so uh and also we see that uh, china being one of the uh, major uh, ex imported importers as well as exporters uh sri lanka to china china to sri lanka uh, that is where uh, china is significant to us so in terms of the facts and data that china is uh, uh, one of the uh, i think world first civilizations um, and hoang uh, ho uh, and and so on and also the most populated uh, 
country, um, more than 1.4 billion uh, in terms of the records, uh, and also bordering China, the countries bordering the 14 countries. Um, and uh, I guess that it should be third biggest land, uh, I think next to Russia, and uh, if I'm correct, uh, Russia and Canada. And, but density is quite uh, minimum, it's look like 145 people per square kilometer. Uh, and also the most significant, the fastest economic uh, centers or countries with uh, much bigger centers uh, 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 within the country. Uh, and, uh, and these are some facts that I collected just to give a background of the country. And of course, I'm not going to talk much about uh, the capital city. Uh, previously, it was Peking and Beijing. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that you know we are going to hear a lot of things uh, on the capital city of China. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, we were also looking at, uh, you know, in, in the context of world context that, you know, how these different cities are performing and also expanding with the current developments where uh, Beijing is one of the growing uh, uh, cities. Uh, we can see here in, in the chart, uh, in, the, in the diagram, where 2030 uh, is going to be one of the most populated places. We are, what is important we can see is that uh, we see these two uh, different uh, uh, two different uh, segments india and china where uh, these two greater population uh, densities so that will be a big factor in future how the urban uh, development in the world context changes so uh, let me uh, go through the program today. So um, since we do not uh, have the item for the sponsor presentation, uh, so um, the next item would be uh, the talk, urban talk, Beijing, the cross section by Professor Li Zhang. Uh, in fact, uh, it was uh, very good to uh, know uh, Professor Li um to uh, some of my academic contacts uh, it was really great professor uh, zhang that uh, you are here today uh, again uh, we must thank uh, for your presence and also something to hear which may not be very much commonly heard uh, from this part of the world and then following uh, this will take about maximum one hour uh, this talk uh, and then after that we have a moderation and discussion uh, here again i welcome architect planner pali vijayaratna uh, for agreeing uh, to come today as a uh, one of the moderators and then architect rukshan vidya lankar uh, as a uh, another moderator so i hope that uh, that would be a real good discussion we can have and also your question Questions can be forwarded uh, through the text messaging system, and these questions will be picked up by the moderators, and uh, answers will be uh, forwarded to the relevant person for answering. I think here, Professor Li Zhang. And uh, finally, uh, Architect Pradeep Fernandu, uh, Secretary of the Institute of Urban Designers, Board of Thanks. So, uh, Welcome all of you again, and uh, hope you will enjoy the evening Urban Talks uh, 7. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, delivering the welcome speech. Now we are moving to the session Urban Talks, Beijing uh, Proc section. We all know that Beijing is China's sprawling capital, has history stretching back three millennia. Yet it's known as more modern architecture as its ancient sites display in a vast collection of cultural relics. Based on the morphological evolution of Beijing in the past eight centuries, a number of contemporary projects in Beijing 
uh, discussed in its relation to the tradition of the city and in its relation to the social economic changes that are taking place. This session will be an interactive session that can be taken a good experience to our professionals. So we have invited the expertise in particular field in China. So let me introduce our resource person, Professor Shan Li. Shan Li is the Dean, Professor of Architecture in the School of Architecture, Vice Principal in Tadi uh, Xinhua University, China. He also leads the design of his Atelier Team Minus in Beijing. He is a currently standing board member of the Architectural Society in China. Alternate Council Member of UIA and the Editor-in-Chief of the Chinese magazine World Architecture. Shan Li is the founder and a main advocate urban economics and interdisciplinary domain focusing on human body and space and the design of active urban spaces. Shan Li's uh, design works cover a wide range of scales from urban designs building to microsome interventions. All of his works adapt the principles of urban economics and try to establish sustainable solutions through the free connection of the human body and the environment. His best internationally known works include a visitor center to the uh, stone pile in Tibet 2013, a youth camp in a seaside community 2017 and the iconic Olympic big air slope in an industrial heritage 2019. Chan Lee was appointed Dean of the School of Architecture, Shano University in 2020. He has since been proposing the idea of scale interventions for architectural education, trying to embrace technological interventions and sociological rethinking, rethinkings in design teaching, cross traditional boundaries of scales, and to seek interdisciplinary fertilization and disruptive intervention. Chan Li is also an active promoter of contemporary Chinese architecture on the international stage. He has curated many exhibitions, competitions, and publications centered around Chinese cities and architecture. He is committed to promote UN and UIA values, particularly SDG awareness in China. Chan Li has been a visiting professor in Polytechno Torino 2017, Syracuse University 2012, and NUS 2010. He has been invited to lecture in DSD, HKU, Beverage, and many other institutions. Shan Li and Atelier Team Minus have won some to well group award for Young Practice Frankfurt 2017. Art Best Art and Culture Building Milan 2014. They are the highly commended London 2013, along with the multiple Chinese national awards. Shan Li is also deeply involved in important state sponsor projects in China. He is currently the architect in chief of uh, Shen Yui Chon and Shen So Big Air, both of Beijing 2022 Olympic Winter Games. He is also the curator of China Pavilion in Venice Architecture in 2020. You are wor warmly welcome, our speaker, Professor Shen Li for the urban talks organized by the Institute of Urban Designers, Sri Lanka. And it's time to take over the session. One hour are available for you, sir. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Janaika, and thank you, Rupa, um, for your generous invitation and for this very detailed 
and very kind introduction of me. Um, it's a great honor of mine to be invited um, to this pre prestigious program. Actually, I have heard about this program, this urban talk program in Sri Lanka, um, in China before. Um, so it's a great honor to participate this talk and to contribute maybe to some of the discussions. And the topic today is, is Beijing a cross section? It's basically some observations of the city's urban transformation, including suburban transformation, and probably um, even include a bit of rural transformation um, around the, the metropolitan city of Beijing after 2010. So it's mainly about things happening, taking place in the last decade. We all know that in 2008, Beijing featured this. Beijing was known to the world through this. And, and back then, the idea about the city of a representing some sort of progress, of some sort of visions about future in China, it was about the collection of objects like this, monumental buildings, iconic structures. But then in the last decade, things has shifted quite a bit from this to this. Is new emphasis, new value, great, great value has been associated with the activities of people in the city. People no longer look up to the monuments and iconic images, and people are no longer satisfied with that. People are more interested in how these urban spaces will be interacting with our human body and how to make ourselves, how to have a cognition of the space you live in to use your body to register a memory of senses of the space. And that is basically the question that has been come hotter and hotter these days in the city of Beijing. So before we continue, let's go back a bit in time and we will go back about a million years. So this was the starting point and before civilization of Beijing, if, if we have a projection of the white lines is, is the border of Beijing to the ancient geography typography, then we, we can see that actually Beijing is located right at the border of the mountainous areas. And then starting from the Northwest, you have almost like a play toll of mountains and then Below this step, you have the plain, you have the affluent plain of northern China. So Beijing is basically a gateway from the mountains in the northwest. And then four major rivers running across the mountains all the way down to the southeast, to the sea. And Beijing was created in this geographical situation. So let's remember this almost diagonal, of course, only diagonal in a map drawn by human beings, but this is very important. It's not north, south, or east and west. It's not perpendicular or orthographic in all, all maps we have been drawing. It is a diagonal. And then the cities were invented by, by ancient Chinese, and Beijing was not the oldest capital city, um, one of the oldest, about 3,000 years ago. You, you do have traces of the ancient cities, and they were created in such a way um, that the structures were laid out um, based on this orthographic grid, which is south, east, south, north, and east and west. So if we zoom in a bit, this was the starting point of Beijing as a major capital city of a dynasty. 
It was about in the middle of the 12th century. If we overlay the original trays, the original image of the city on the current map, the blue map you see in the background is basically what is Beijing is now. And if we overlap what it was in 12th century, it was like this. This was 13th century. And here you see a shift slightly to the north. And then if we notice the area in pink, it represents the water system. And this system has always been a very important part of Beijing. So in Beijing, you have two systems. One is the road and building system. And the other is the lake, the rivers, the canals. The former system represents the Confucianist artificial structures, hierarchy, neighborhoods, mansions, palaces. And the water system in the diagonal represents nature, the Taoism belief of the connection between the nature and, and people. So it's like going back, return to the nature right in the city. And this is what Beijing was like in the starting of the 20th century. You have all just basically all the important points of what Beijing is now in the center old city. 1950s, 1980s, as rumor put it, as Jamaica put it, the sprawl of the city taking place. And still you see the water system in pink in the diagonal. They coexist with the sprawling of the city in 1990s, 2000s. And in the very north, you have the Olympic Park for 2008 Olympics. So we do see this orthographic grid, which lays out the base for everything that is kind of Confucianist hierarchy. And then you have this overlay of the diagonal, almost a diagonal grid formed by water system and canals and green spaces, which represents the overlay of nature, the collaging of nature inside the city. And it has been a tradition. So today we are moving, we'll be moving along this diagonal. We will not be moving in, in the traditional north-south axis. We will be moving along this line. And we will move from the center of the city to the outer skirt of the city and even to the mountains and probably to somewhere that cannot be um, rightly represented in this screen, in the image you see on the screen. So it's further northwest, it's all the way up to the mountains. And then one project that's all the way down to the southeast at the seafront. We will look at six projects, um, most of them my projects, um, but also some projects include um, other people's work. But before we start that, uh, let me show you a very small video, um, because probably you know that, that Beijing is currently bidding for the UIA Congress in 2026. We will be presenting our final bid in at the end of July. Um, so we have made a five minute promotion video of Beijing and which which I myself participated in the making of the video um, a lot. Um, I'm not sure what kind of quality you may have on the other end of, of this video conference, um, but I will try to share it. Is the Great Wall. Um, I, I don't think the, the sound of the video will be uh, good on your side. Um, yes, uh, 
we do not hear much on the sounds well probably let's just turn down the sound i i will do the narration the, the starting point is basically telling people and, and we we are bidding um, for the 2026 Congress and the theme that we are proposing is back to balance and formed with three parts. The first part is the balance between human and human, is the human to human ties starting from the old part of the city, the centre and all the way to the outer skirts to the industrial heritage sites. It's just to show to the world that, and currently in Beijing, it is people's life that has been discussed most. And these are architects talking about their projects, very small scale, um, but very detailed, elegant projects um, in the old city. like a small microcosm garden or a stage for children. They're all created, not in a fancy new urban setup, but right in, in the center of, of local neighborhoods and also industrial renovation projects. And this is a manager of, of an old factory basically converted um, to a new property manager. His, his entire factory has been transformed. And the second balance is the balance between human and nature. Probably we will be talking about this more today. It's, it's the renewal of the urban water system using low carbon sustainable technologies to combine mitigation with water storage and with landscaping. And this human nature relationship is further expressed, tested in the redevelopment of the rural. And the third balance is between man and technology. We, we, we do have our own doubts about this widely available technology, in particular information technology. And then our point of view is that only when technology serves people not people serving technology, the technology can be adopted, can be regarded as a positive force. So these technologies, how they transform a very old um, residential area. Um, the, the rest um, is it, it, just um, kind of festive invitation. To, to the architects around the world. So let's um, go ahead with, with our presentation. The first project right in the center of Beijing is in this very old dilapidated residential area known as the Baita Si area. And Baita Si basically means the, the white, um, the, the area of, of the white pagoda temple and where you, you, you do see this white pagoda in the center of the image, and then below it, you see the horizontal old Hutong areas that are dilapidated. Um, I was invited in, in 2017 to be a, a kind of consultant architect, but at the same time, also a curator um, for Beijing Design Week in this area. So we, we made a few programs 
um, including architectural projects, but started, we, we started with a program um, that engaged um, the local people, um, in particular, the women, because they are very good at, at doing this kind of wee wee work. So we invited them to weave um, different kind of things, decorations, to decorate the urban furniture. Um, they first they 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 were quite skeptic, um, but then they took it quite actively, and they discussed all the patterns, colors they would like. And we just need to purchase all the threads and the rest would be done by them. This is how they decorate their trees, um, their street facades, trees, lampposts. Um, also, we invited different architects, starting from that little patchwork, and we asked the local manager of this entire area to select a few courtyards and starting from this courtyard like an acupuncture work starting from one courtyard and then expanding the project maybe to the surroundings this is one architect architect name of the architect is Zhang Yue who is very good at calculation uh, of, of the maximizing the use of a very small space so in inside this very small courtyard and you see what was before the renovation in the four smaller images and then in the four bigger images you do see how he designed um, the new furniture and also this modifiable um, mezzanine floor to create more use for the traditional space you don't do all this kind of window dressing for street facades, but you do what um, can be later used by people, by the residents. And probably this is the only, um, shall we say, more conspicuous, more visible work in the entire project in the last four years, um, which is done by the architect, the female architect, Xu Tiantian, and who is the founder of the DNA architecture office in Beijing. And she took one of the um, less um, quite unusual building in the cold chart fabric. And there was a two story building, um, which was done by the local resident himself, um, pretty illegally. Um, but then Shi Tian converted into a small art gallery. This was which she has done. Um, you do see some of the more um, familiar contemporary languages that you can see um, in, in, in many contemporary works in Asia and, and also in elsewhere. And so you, you do see the different approaches taking place in this place. And our point is that in this kind of transformation, you don't need to have a master plan. We are pretty against master plan in these areas. You just need to provide the infrastructure. The infrastructure, the most important infrastructure for these kind of design projects and transformation to take place is the infrastructure of communication. You have to set up the link, the connection between people and people, between the designers, and the users. Starting from then on, you do have a direction and where it leads to, it's pretty unpredictable. Um, but that is, is the beauty about this kind of project. And the second project, let's move on to the slight outer skirt of the city, another renovation project and this time is the renovation of um, the Beijing steel factory it used to be um, the largest steel industry um, corporation in China and it, 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 it was it was started um, about a hundred years ago and stopped production about 10 years ago. The production of, of the factory has been moved elsewhere in China. 
but all the structures has remained. So um, quite um, a huge amount of transformation is taking place here. And I have been, what I'm doing here is the big air slope, which is a special winter sport. It's pretty like the extreme sport for bicycles and for um, roller skaters um, in, in, in the summer sport area. This is for winter. It is the, the athletes will be doing this kind of very um, challenging jumps um, on these slopes. So this is where it is in the Beijing map. And the selection of the siting of this slope is pretty interesting. Because this sport, the big air sport, was invented by the Brits and then very popular in Belgium, in Germany, in, in Canada and Norway. They, they ask to be in one of the centers in, in the urban area because um, most of the fans, the fan base, are young people. Um, they, they ask whether we can do that in the Tiananmen Square, right in the center of the city. And no, that is not possible. And, and then a few options. And then we provided this. Why not make a slope right next to these cooling towers? Um, the, the very memorizable um, silhouette uh, on the western outskirt of Beijing. And they accept it. So uh, this, this is the bridge, the new bridge getting across this um, area below. And from the bridge, you do have a site of the slope and also the structures modified, modified, renovated for the use in the games and then after the games. So you have the entire factory, basically, um, the transformation of the entire factory being speeded up by the inclusion of a winter game venue. Um, don't ask me about the selection of the color. Um, there are many interpretations of, of what rainbow stands for, and I, I don't want to get myself into um, the <laughs> pretty contentious discussion about that. Um, uh, th this is what it looks in, in the night. Um, I worked with, with Joe Fisterold, who is the FIT, the Federation of International Scheme um, manager of this sport. We worked closely to make sure because these profiles or where the, the, the athletes um, actually slides down and then where he jumps, where he or she jumps and then where she or he lands, it, it's slightly changeable. So it's, so it's quite delicate structure. I, I worked with him quite closely to make sure um, that the entire thing will not be taller than the cooling tower, but in the end, it's still the profile has to be taller. So actually we have sunken the landing area into the lake, 5.5 meters. So to keep um, the top of the jump and still lower than the cooling tower, this is what you see um, when you're out and when you try to jump. Um, the selection and then the coding of the colors before they were prefabricated and painted. And it's, this is the relation with one of the cooling towers, the closest the cooling tower and reflection in the lake. Um, the making of the wings, including perforated aluminum panels, and it, it's used um, for the protection of wind because for these kind of sport, wind from the sides would be very harmful. We have to um, mitigate the impact of the wind. This is how it looks, um, how it has changed the skyline of Western Beijing. And then surrounding the cooling lake, it used to be the cooling lake. Now it is reclaimed 
and for urban activities. We planned several areas of urban activity. This we planned for doing Tai Chi's for the old people. A renovation of the oxygen factory. On the top left, what it used to be. On the lower right, after, before and after, before and after. And here we see the transformation of the bigger factory. Um, for this factory alone, um, I invited a team from Polito, um, the university where I was invited to teach, and because they have done the project in, in the Michelin factory, um, the Paco Dora project, very well known for its big factory transformation. So we asked the same team here to do that kind of thing again. And the rest of the factory is we keep the original fabric and we add one level or one and level and a half to it. And all these new fabrics are in perpendicular to the original ones. This is the finished area from some activity taking place. The original structure transformed and then used as the gateway to the entire gaming area to the venue and in 2019 in, in December um, well this is pretty poignant because this was supposed to be the earliest test event for Beijing 2022 winter games but until now it was the last because of the pandemic um, in the smaller spaces of the factory again quite poignant we, we we can't entirely open it still we can't open it now because of the pandemic um, before and after comparisons and along the waterfront And this was designed by one landscape architect who designed the zigzag way into the water so you can have a very intimate view at the cooling towers and also the jump. I remember quite well when, when this picture was taken, I was walking along the lake on this side of the lake with a very old man who grew up in the Shogun, in this capital steel factory and who what used to be um, one of the department directors of the factory. And then I asked him, he was like 20 years senior of me. Um, I asked him, um, do you accept this new skyline? And he told me, he, he took a while and, and said, yes, I do. Well, that to me, it, it, it's it's the biggest um, compliment. And this was in the um, test event. I don't think I can do our, um, any of this. Um, actually, in in China, I think there are only less than ten athletes can do really can do this kind of sport. So the reuse, the post game use of this structure would be mainly focused on the landing area, not the in run where the slope is the steepest and where you accelerate. No one, um, no normal people can do that. And this is how it is done. Um, regrets, yes. Um, pretty in the air where you have the skyline where you have all these things and it's it's pretty um close to what we have um conceived but beneath the structure originally we planned um a land installation um that makes the entire land uh, looking like a a farming land but it, it wasn't accepted because and fits you need this area for the running of the venue and they will have tents, they will have 
um, overlay structures, temporary facilities, all kinds of temporary facilities. Um, so the, this area has to be flat now in a pretty boring um, piece of concrete. Um, if you look at the image, you do see this vast scale of the structure and without any um, kind of transform, transformation to the human scale. So this is, is a regret. Um, the third project is in the mountainous areas village, um, this time moving to the suburban space. Um, it, it, it's a gardening village, a reconstructed gardening village. Um, but, but, but we are not focusing on the gardening village. We're focusing on the um, art center or the art space in the center of the gardening village. And because um, the, the, the one doing this project um, the the invest the investor the developer they wanted to have a very visible conspicuous um, object like structure somehow we we convinced um, this investor to put the entire art space underground and because um, in in the study of the original fabric uh, of the history maps. Um, there the, the used to be a stage, yeah, a stage for the soldiers because the village was used by soldiers um, before the 20th century, from the 17th to the 18th century. It was used by soldiers. Um, it, it was almost like a military barrack, um, but, but in ancient China, these military barracks, they do two things. One is the military things and the other is gunning. And, and their entertainment mainly comes from this stage. And before, in front of the stage, it was a little plaza. So, so we, we convinced the investor to restore this plaza to keep the space open. We just need to tilt up the ground a bit. And from the lifted corner, we can enter the art space below. And here it is. And using a ramp, getting to the spaces below. By doing this, um, we somehow achieved um, this kind of invisible building effect. It's, it's just a ground um, rode up a bit. Um, and, and then the entire experience will, will be um, on above and below um, the lifted ground. Includes um, symbol referring to the stage, ancient stage, and now they can see through this stage. The fourth project that's to the very northwest. This is this time is all the way up to the mountains. Um, another winter game venue is the ski jump center for Beijing 2022. Um, this time, and the elephant in the room is that no ski jump is invisible Be because ski jumps, they, they are by nature an iconic structure. And so um, we, we, we did follow the profile of the competition profile and adopted this ancient Chinese auspicious um, object known as Ruyi, and it, it has this curved um, body and then a dish at the top. So we created this dish at the top, and this is not only for the look of it, it's for the use of it, because um, again, there are many, and there aren't many ski jumpers in China, less than 100 probably. And again, all the wings and the structures are used for wind protection, for uh, athlete protection, two ski jump hills, a stadium below. This is how it looks in the mountain. Um, again, you don't expect people, uh, normal people, to use the in-run, just the landing and the stadium. 
So the only way to connect this entire thing is to have something meaningful at the top that can be used. So we created this ring shaped dish. And also we create this ring in the valley is a footbridge. The footbridge connects not only the ski jump, um, but also the two cross country venues. So people can have some kind of um, pedestrian experience in this valley. It's pretty typical for host game um, users for this kind of mountain venues. Um, in China currently, um, there are a, a great popularity of the outdoor sports. So the venue owners are thinking about creating some sort of cross country running event on, on this footbridge. Um, this is the sport itself. I, I don't think this sport is, is for normal people. Probably we can't do it for recreation. We need some special training to do it. And the stadium, we will talk about the stadium a bit. Um, I think we will skip all the technical details about the structure of this thing. Um, it, it's pretty delicate and sometimes quite sophisticated. That's not the point. The point is, is the creation of this ring on the top. 4,000 square meters of a space, of, of space with no obstruction. And it, it was done, it was made possible by this calculation of this very um, elegant structure. It is done by one of my best friends, a structural engineer, Mr. Yang Xiao, who did all the calculations and who basically freed up the entire space from any columns. And you can see for the ring, the in, inner opening is slightly moved to the front, so the center of the weight will be right in the back making the entire structure more stable. We have open spaces inside, so we can make it multi-purpose, including exhibition activities, cafe, small display, performance, conference, um, if you get in there, you do see um, the inside is not finished yet, but there are already people doing all kinds of things there. And this is um, the fine art, the, the, the association of fine artists um, one day doing a collective painting event in the ring. And another thing that can be achieved through the creation of the ring is that you have a direct eye contact with the athletes below. It wasn't possible to have this view angle. So all the TV broadcasters, they use flying cameras to catch this viewpoint. Now this is directly available to the spectators. For the stadium, we also need to have flexibility we also need to have all kinds of scenarios that can be used after the games so we insisted that we have a soccer field because if you have a soccer field a flat soccer field you can do basically everything from 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 car delivery um, to um, music concerts outdoor music concerts to all kinds of shows and this is one of them. And there is another thing that I myself am very proud of, is that I convinced the Federation of International Skiing to rotate the ski jump from the black line to the blue line. Because when the ski jumpers, when they are flying in the air, they do have very good eye contact with, with what is surrounding them. It used to be that if you fly along the black line, you will be facing that little hill 
on your right hand side. But if you fly along the blue line, then you have all the views across the valley all the way to the depth. And if you see here, around here, you do have actually the remains of the Great Wall. Um, here is the remains of the Great Wall. You do have the di direct eye contact of that. Um, let's move on to the fifth project. Again, pretty far away from the center of Beijing. We were, for project number four, we were in the valleys. We were, we were in the mountains, pretty high above. And this time we move below to the seafront is, is the Arania youth camp. Um, again, a, a new kind of lifestyle for and the Beijing middle class is for young parents to bring their children away from the city and further than 200 kilometers away from the city to the seafront or to the valleys um, to have a after school program, a short after school program, um, usually taking three to one, three days to one week. And this is for one of the best um, after school uh, companies in China, in Northern China, it's called the Idea Company. They provide all these kind of after school programs. What we did is that we created a ramp that is twisting around itself. So we can have two courtyards, one courtyard for open activity, the other for educational purposes. But what is the most important is the slope, is, is, is the entire ramp. Um, because on, only by doing this can we make the children run continuously because children, what they like most, at least for Chinese children, and for Beijing uh, children, is that they would like to run as long as they can. So we created this entire concrete structure twisting around itself and, and beneath and above the ramp, and there are different kinds of spaces for activities. Um, this is inside the building. The second level, dormitories. But it's the ramp um, that is the feature of this project. And we were stupid enough to, to thought, to think that probably we, we can design all the games along the ramps and for the children, but actually they didn't need that because the, the idea uh, company, they are the ones who, who um, are doing all the kind of research on children's psychology. And so they do invent games, um, on-site inventions of games. That's the games they invented. And this is not a game invented. This, of course, is it's simply rock climbing. And interestingly, because of the children, um, they played around this plate. They brought their parents to. So at times when there are no um, after school programs, this building can be temporarily converted into a community center. It can be used for events for adults. We even had one architect's event here in 2017. And this is after the event, after all the conferences, we climb up to the big ramp and we did a graffiti together. And standing here is, is um, probably you know him, um, Robert Greenwood from Snow Etta. And Barnes companies, um, they, they, did shows along the ramp because the ramp creates all this kind of body movement um, that um, probably would be difficult to achieve um, without the ramps. The last project, the last project is an unfinished one and we are going back to the northern part of the city and this time to Tsinghua University and that also shows at one important direction Beijing is going. 
Beijing used to go east and west and north and south as sprawling, but now there's going, and it used Beijing used to go up higher and higher skyscrapers, but now Beijing is mainly going one direction, is down to the underground. And because the city has somehow decided that we can no longer have more skyscrapers and we need to contain our footprint of the city at what it is now. We can't let the city sprawl further. So the only space that we can have more space, additional space for new density is beneath the ground. And that is exactly what we are doing here in Tsinghua. Um, after an international competition last year, we won. And by doing this new international student center for Tsinghua University, 50,000 square meters of space beneath a baseball field and four small soccer fields. So the building is, is entirely subterranean. And here what we did again, this kind of tilting up the ground a bit, and this time we have a good reason to do it, because for baseball field, you do have the outer skirt of the baseball field and the corner that you can easily tilt up while keeping the baseball field flat. Um, you tilt up and you have the main entrance, and then you have another entrance here at the other side across the football field. And beneath the very narrow space in between the two sports fields, you have another access to the underground. But these three spaces are what we have, um, the access from the what is above the ground to the underground. And then the entire space would be underground. So this is what you, you see while entering the building. You take the ramp to the space, sunken space, half out door, a tunnel linking to other buildings to make sure that all the surrounding buildings have easy access to the underground space of the building and the lobby going down to the spaces. Um, some are huge. Um, multi-purpose halls. This is the other entrance in the middle of the two clusters of sports fields. Going from B1 to B2 to the other side. And what we are trying to do here, this time we, we have a very obvious challenge. It what to do with the underground spaces to make they feel not as bad as normal underground spaces. And what we've adopted is the technology that controls the airflow and adding um, very little but very important ingredients to the air you breathe underground so you can feel um, a little bit better or probably and not as bad as normal underground spaces. And other important thing is light. So we have together working, working together with a special lighting company. Um, it, it, it right next to Tsinghua is one major Chinese lighting company. They're doing this kind of artificial lighting that they can imitate. Um, they can learn from what is um, happening in the climate, in the weather, and somehow projects this kind of feeling from their lighting um, in the underground. Because when you have even have a day lighting um, kind of conducts or pipelines or fibers, um, it's still not feel that way, that above ground. But this time, when you use this technology, people do from the lighting, when you read the environment, and when your cognitive system is working, it does indicates that probably it, you, you are not um, in a space as bad as normal underground spaces. And also for this evacuating path, which is required by firefighting regulations, 130 meters long, we create this interactivity between the walkers and, and runners 
um, you can book um, with your cell phone. So your um, movement uh, will somehow be shown on, along the wall, on the side walls. And all of these is trying to bring an additional experience, quality of experience um, that is not normally associated with underground spaces. And so um, the entire spectrum, the lighting covering the entire spectrum, um, this kind of lighting uh, of sunlight are being used in B2 and B3 to make sure that um, natural vegetation can be made in these spaces. So, um, if I may, um, to conclude, is from this cross-section of Beijing, um, showing that um, the shift of the emphasis, the shift of intention from the object side, from the physical side, from the image side of buildings, to the quality side, and that is related to human experience, no matter in what scale. Um, if I may, I would say, and that is what Beijing, what the urbanization, urban design of Beijing in the past decade and probably in the next um, decade um, would be about. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>